Hi, you guys. Um, back for some more poetry and uh, Tuesdays with Maury. And I think we might even finish the book today, which was not something that I was expecting. Yesterday I said I thought we had some, some more of the book left than we actually do. I think we might get to the end of it today. So let's see. But first, let's go to our poem. So let's see. So here we are. We'll go back to Rumi for a poem. I know that's a favorite of some people. Um, and this one's called Only Breath. And this is one of my favorites of his of, of all time. Um, let me read it. Only Breath. Not Christian or Jew or Muslim. Not Hindu, Buddhist, Sufi or Zen. Not any religion or cultural system. I am not from the east or the west, not out of the ocean or up from the ground, not natural or ethereal, not composed of elements at all. I do not exist, am not an entity in this world or in the next, did not descend from Adam and Eve or any origin story. My place is placeless, a trace of the traceless, neither body or soul. I belong to the beloved, have seen the two worlds as one and that one call to and know. First, last, outer, inner, only that breath breathing human being. This is such a beautiful poem and um, Rumi, right from the beginning, starts off by saying he doesn't belong to any religion. But of course, it's uh, contradictory because he is, in fact, a Sufi or he was a, a Sufi master, a Sufi teacher, which is a branch of Islam. So he is Muslim and he is a Sufi, but he's saying he doesn't belong to any religion or cultural system. So it's kind of about how there's all these labels that we define ourselves with, but in the end, at the root of it all, or I should say above it all, um, our souls are kind of beyond whatever labels we put on them. We transcend that. And then the rest is, is again, all these labels, which are opposites in the poem. He's not from the East or the West, not from the ocean or the ground, not natural or ethereal. Um, and then he touches upon culture. Even he says, I did not descend from Adam and Eve or any origin story. So he's just, again, trying to say that we have all these cultural stories and all these uh, labels that we use. But in reality, each of us is beyond all of that. He says, my place is placeless, a trace of the traceless, neither body or soul. So um, he, Rumi believed, Rumi was one of those people that, as he says here, he has seen the two worlds as one. So he he was kind of in constant contact with God. He, he Sufis developed this union with God that they kind of maintain at all times. And all religions have these mystical branches, meaning the um, people in the religion that are developing this mystical union with God that kind of, they kind of maintain even as they go about their daily lives. So Rumi was one of those. And what he means by that is the two worlds, the spiritual world and the physical world. For him, it's kind of the same. He's in, he's in both at once all the time. And I think for most of us, we get glimpses of the spiritual world. Um, but mostly we're so rooted in the physical world that it's hard to kind of, um, stay in the spiritual for any, uh, amount of time. But Rumi says that he does. Uh, he belongs to the beloved. He, he Rumi referred to God as the beloved in most of his poems. Um, and then that last stanza, first, last, outer, inner. So again, just all these labor labels. He's saying he's all of them, only that breath breathing human being. So to be a human is to be part of both of these worlds. And traditionally, it's our breath that connects us. So the breath is a very physical thing, but it's also a representation of the spiritual. And so by breathing in and breathing out, you kind of participate in that um, belonging to the two worlds. 
So that's another poem by Rumi, Only Breath. Um, let's go on to Mori and we'll see where we left off and we'll pick up from there. So here we are back with Mori. And like I said, I think we're pretty close to the end, but we'll see how far we get today. So um, we'll pick up from where we left off yesterday. I heard a nice little story the other day, Maury says. He closes his eyes for a moment and I wait. Okay, the story is about a little wave bobbing along in the ocean, having a grand old time. He's enjoying the wind and the fresh air until he notices the other waves in front of him crashing against the shore. My God, this is terrible, the wave says. Look what's going to happen to me. Then along comes another wave. It sees the first wave looking grim and it says to him, why do you look so sad? The first wave says, you don't understand. We're all going to crash. All of us waves are going to be nothing. Isn't it terrible? The second wave says, no, you don't understand. You're not a wave. You're part of the ocean. I smile. Maury closes his eyes again. Part of the ocean, he says, part of the ocean. I watch him breathe in and out, in and out. The 14th Tuesday, we say goodbye. It was cold and damp as I walked up the steps to Maury's house. I took in little details, things I hadn't noticed for all the times I'd visited. The cut of the hill, the stone facade of the house, the pachysandra plants, the low shrubs. I walked slowly, taking my time, stepping on dead wet leaves that flattened beneath my feet. Charlotte had called the day before to tell me Maury was not doing well. This was her way of saying the final days had arrived. Maury had canceled all of his appointments and had been sleeping much of the time, which was unlike him. He never cared for sleeping, not when there were people he could talk with. He wants you to come visit, Charlotte said. But Mitch, yes, he's very weak. The porch steps, the glass in the front door. I absorbed these things in a slow, observant manner, as if seeing them for the first time. I felt the tape recorder in the bag on my shoulder, and I unzipped it to make sure I had tapes. I don't know why. I always had tapes. Connie answered the bell. Normally buoyant, she had a drawn look on her face. Her hello was softly spoken. How's he doing? I said. Not so good. She bit her lower lip. I don't like to think about it. He's such a sweet man, you know? I knew. This is such a shame. Charlotte came down the hall and hugged me. She said that Maury was still sleeping, even though it was 10 a.m. We went into the kitchen. I helped her straighten up, noticing all the bottles of pills lined up on the table, a small army of brown plastic soldiers with white caps. My old professor was taking morphine now to ease his breathing. I put the food I had brought with me into the refrigerator, soup, vegetable cakes, tuna salad. I apologized to Charlotte for bringing it. Maury hadn't chewed food like this in months. We both knew that, but it had become a small tradition. Sometimes when you're losing someone, you hang on to whatever tradition you can. I waited in the living room where Maury and Ted Koppel had done their first interview. I read the newspaper that was lying on the table. Two Minnesota children had shot each other playing with their father's guns. A baby had been found buried in a garbage can in an alley in Los Angeles. I put the paper, I put down the paper and stared into the empty fireplace. I tapped my shoe lightly on the hardwood floor. 
Eventually, I heard a door open and close, then Charlotte's footsteps coming toward me. All right, she said softly. He's ready for you. I rose and I turned toward our familiar spot, then saw a strange woman sitting at the end of the hall in a folding chair, her eyes on a book, her legs crossed. This was a hospice nurse, part of the 24-hour watch. Maury's study was empty. I was confused. Then I turned back hesitantly to the bedroom, and there he was, lying in bed under the sheet. I had seen him like this only one other time, when he was getting massaged, and the echo of his aphorism, when you're in bed, you're dead, began anew inside my head. I entered, pushing a smile onto my face. He wore a yellow pajama-like top, and a blanket covered him from the chest down. The lump of his form was so withered that I almost thought there was something missing. He was as small as a child. Maury's mouth was open, and his skin was pale and tight against his cheekbones. When his eyes rolled toward me, he tried to speak, but I heard only a soft grunt. There he is, I said, mustering all the excitement I could find in my empty till. He exhaled, shut his eyes, then smiled, the very effort seeming to tire him. My dear friend, he finally said. I am your friend, I said. I'm not so good today. Tomorrow will be better. He pushed out another breath and forced a nod. He was struggling with something beneath the sheets, and I realized he was trying to move his hands toward the opening. Hold, he said. I pulled the covers down and grasped his fingers. They disappeared inside my own. I leaned in close, a few inches from his face. It was the first time I had seen him unshaven, the small white whiskers looking so out of place, as if someone had shaken salt neatly across his cheeks and chin. How could there be new life in his beard when it was draining everywhere else? Maury, I said softly. Coach, he corrected. Coach, I said. I felt a shiver. He spoke in short bursts, inhaling air, exhaling words. His voice was thin and raspy. He smelled of ointment. You are a good soul. A good soul. Touched me, he whispered. He moved my hands to his heart. Here. I felt as if I had a pit in my throat. Coach? Ah? I don't know how to say goodbye. He patted my hand weakly, keeping it on his chest. This is how we say goodbye. He breathed softly, in and out. I could feel his rib cage rise and fall. Then he looked right at me. Love you, he rasped. I love you too, coach. No, you do know something else. What else do you know? You always have. His eyes got small and then he cried his face contorting like a baby who hasn't figured out how his tear ducts work. I held him close for several minutes. I rubbed his loose skin. I stroked his hair. I put a palm against his face and felt the bones close to the flesh and the tiny wet tears as if squeezed from a dropper. When his breathing approached normal again, I cleared my throat and said I knew he was tired, so I would be back next Tuesday, and I expected him to be a little more alert, thank you. 
He snorted lightly, as close as he could come to a laugh. It was a sad sound, just the same. I picked up the unopened bag with the tape recorder. Why had I even brought this? I knew we would never use it. I leaned in and kissed him closely, my face against his, whiskers on whiskers, skin on skin, holding it there longer than normal in case it gave him even a split second of pleasure. Okay then, I said, pulling away. I blinked back the tears, and he smacked his lips together and raised his eyebrows at the sight of my face. I like to think it was a fleeting moment of satisfaction for my dear old professor. He had finally made me cry. Okay then, he whispered. Graduation. Maury died on a Saturday morning. His immediate family was with him in the house. Rob made it in from Tokyo. He got to kiss his father goodbye, and John was there, and of course Charlotte was there, and Charlotte's cousin, Marcia, who had written the poem that so moved Maury at his unofficial memorial service, the poem that likened him to a tender sequoia. They slept in shifts around his bed. Maury had fallen into a coma, two days after our final visit, and the doctor said he could go at any moment. Instead, he hung on through a tough afternoon, through a dark night. Finally, on the 4th of November, when those he loved had left the room just for a moment to grab coffee in the kitchen, the first time none of them were with him since the coma began, Maury stopped breathing and he was gone. I believe he died this way on purpose. I believe he wanted no chilling moments, no one to witness his last breath and be haunted by it, the way he had been haunted by his mother's death notice telegram or by his father's corpse in the city morgue. I believe he knew that he was in his own bed, that his books and his notes and his small hibiscus plant were nearby. He wanted to go serenely, and that is how he went. The funeral was held on a damp, windy morning. The grass was wet and the sky was the color of milk. We stood by the hole in the earth, close enough to hear the pond water lapping against the edge and to see the ducks shaking off their feathers. Although hundreds of people had wanted to attend, Charlotte kept this gathering small, just a few close friends and relatives. Rabbi Axelrad read a few poems. Maury's brother, David, who still walked with a limp from his childhood polio, lifted the shovel and tossed dirt in the grave as per tradition. At one point when Maury's ashes were placed into the ground, I glanced around the cemetery. Maury was right. It was indeed a lovely spot, trees and grass and a sloping hill. You talk, I'll listen, he had said. I tried doing that in my head and to my happiness, found that the imagined conversation felt almost natural. I looked down at my hands, saw my watch, and realized why. It was Tuesday. My father moved through days of we, singing each new leaf out of each tree, and every child was sure that spring danced when she heard my father sing. That is a poem by E.E. E. Cummings, read by Maury's son, Rob, at the memorial service. Conclusion I look back sometimes at the person I was before I rediscovered my old professor. 
I want to talk to that person. I want to tell him what to look out for, what mistakes to avoid. I want to tell him to be more open, to ignore the lure of advertised values, to pay attention when your loved ones are speaking, as if it were the last time you might hear them. Mostly, I want to tell that person to get on an airplane and visit a gentle old man in West Newton, Massachusetts, sooner rather than later, before that old man gets sick and loses his ability to dance. I know I cannot do this. None of us can undo what we've done or relive a life already recorded. But if Professor Morris Schwartz taught me anything at all, it was this. There is no such thing as too late in life. He was changing until the day he said goodbye. Not long after Maury's death, I reached my brother in Spain. We had a long talk. I told him I respected his distance and that all I wanted was to be in touch in the present, not just the past, to hold him in my life as much as he could let me. You're my only brother, I said. I don't want to lose you. I love you. I had never said such a thing to him before. A few days later, I received a message on my fax machine. It was typed in the sprawling, poorly punctuated, all cap letters fashion that always characterized my brother's words. Hi, I've joined the 90s, it began. He wrote a few little stories, what he'd been doing that week, a couple of jokes. At the end, he signed off this way. I have heartburn and diarrhea at the moment. Life's a bitch. Chat later? Signed, Sore Tush. I laughed until there were tears in my eyes. This book was largely Maury's idea. He called it our final thesis. Like the best of work projects, it brought us closer together, and Maury was delighted when several publishers expressed interest, even though he died before meeting any of them. The advance money helped pay Maury's enormous medical bills, and for that we were both grateful. The title, by the way, we came up with one day in Maury's office. He liked naming things. He had several ideas, but when I said, how about Tuesdays with Maury? He smiled in an almost blushing way, and I knew that was it. After Maury died, I went through boxes of old college material, and I discovered a final paper I had written for one of his classes. It was 20 years old now. On the front page were my penciled comments scribbled to Maury, and beneath them were his comments scribbled back. Mine began, Dear Coach. His began, Dear Player. For some reason, each time I read that, I miss him more. Have you ever really had a teacher? One who saw you as raw, as a raw but precious thing, a jewel that, with wisdom, could be polished to a proud shine. If you are lucky enough to find your way to such teachers, you will always find your way back. Sometimes it is only in your head. Sometimes it is right alongside their beds. The last class of my old professor's life took place once a week in his home by a window in his study where he could watch a small hibiscus plant shed its pink flowers. The class met on Tuesdays. No books were required. The subject was the meaning of life. It was taught from experience. The teaching goes on. That is the end, you guys. That's the end of the story. Um, so beautiful. And I hope you, I hope you really enjoyed hearing about, um, Maury's life and, um, 
I hope you recognized a lot of things that we talked about in class this year, even in this story. A lot of the themes I feel like overlap, but I'm just going to leave you with, with this for today. And there's actually one more chapter. It's a part that got added on for the 20th anniversary edition of the book. So that means the author came back 20 years later to kind of add on that. Um, one more chapter. So we'll read that tomorrow, but I'm just going to leave you today with this original ending of the book. So have a great day and make the best of it. And I'll see you tomorrow for that last afterward chapter. Have a good one, you guys.